Hello, hello, hola, bienvenidos. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our wine webinar. My name is Lizzie Butler. I am the director of wine for Vine Connections. And I have the honor and the pleasure of sitting virtually across from Laura Catena of Luca and La Fosta Wines. Laura, it is always wonderful to see you. How are you? Thanks, Lizzie. I, I always get frustrated with this uh, speaker view that I can't see the faces. But that's I okay. know. I'm going to pretend that, that uh, some of my friends are out there, which, which I am sure, I'm sure they are. Well, we have people tuning in from Mendoza to Boston. Yeah, there's, to there's that, that need, Oh, actually, I can see the chat. Miami too. to San Francisco. Oh, Sally and Robert. Oh, my <laughs> God. Oh, my gosh, Sally and Robert. Tell, <laughs> you get to tell the story with the. Uh, oh, my gosh, Sally with, and Robert. With Rob, well, actually, they, no, it's Robert and Sally. They are the reason I'm. Sally yeah. And I will. I will. <laughs> I will tell that story. I will totally tell that story. Oh, there's Kelly. Um, Hi, Kelly. <laughs> so yeah, so we can hear we can hear you guys through your chats to know that you're all with us from across the globe. We're so excited. Um, so uh, I personally, as well as Vine Connections, as an importer, we import. We are based in Sausalito, California. Um, we import wines, premium wines from Chile and Argentina, as well as boutique sake from Japan. Um, and although we are virtually connecting, Laura, you are just across the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. There's also Patty from RNDC. Hello, Patty. Yes, Patty. Awesome. I love it. And, and Janice. I love, we've got a, we've got a good crew with us tonight. I'll tell you, we've, we've got the team with us, the international yeah. team. Um, so it's always nice to be on the same time zone as you, Adriana. Laura. It's nice to see you. Um, and you know, I was thinking this morning that, you know how many people ask you, you know, how did you start working in wine? how did you start working in the wine industry? And I usually have two parts to my answer. And the first is that, you know, I wasn't really searching out for the wine world. The wine world kind of found me. Um, and the second part of my answer is that the most crazy serendipitous story led me to one place on the map of the world and to one woman and that, place was Mendoza, Argentina, and that woman was Laura Catena. And it's because I came across your book, Vino Argentino, randomly in a library one day. And fast forward, I was packing up my life and moving to Mendoza. And I lived in Mendoza and I worked for your family, the Catena Winery family. And um, you've been a part of my wine journey ever since. So yeah, it, yeah, you you've betrayed us a little bit with Chile, but that's okay. I know. So I lived in Mendoza. I <laughs> then spent some time living and working in Chile. We can call those the dark ages. Yeah, those um, are the dark moments. I have to drink wine every day to forget. But I will tell I, if you remember that day. I said, "Lauda, Argentina will always be in my heart, and it will never leave." And it's stayed that. true until today. I know um, that. I know that. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I came back to the States after that, and it's been amazing to work with Vine Connections and having known these wines from the origin to the U.S. market has been really an amazing experience. And I think the evolution of Argentina has been one of the most tremendous to live with, with them and with you all. Um, and, you know, that really ties into the theme tonight of why the time is now to be drinking Argentine wine. Uh, there are many, many reasons, um, and we're going to talk all about all of them tonight. Um, but I mean, you, Laura, you're, you're a woman who needs little to no introduction. Um, you are uh, founder of Luca and La Posta Wines. You also work with Catena Wines, which is your family winery. Um, you also are a doctor. You are a mother of three. You are an author of now multiple books. And I usually say you're a woman who has 40 hours in her day. Somehow you get all these things done. Um, but you've been very much a mentor to me. And I know you're very much a mentor to many people in the wine industry. So I know a lot of people are very excited tonight to hear what you have to say about what's going on in Argentina, um, your perspectives on a lot of storylines right now. Um, so we're going to dive into it. And I hey, hope this, everyone has a glass of wine. Guys, this Luca Chardonnay is really good. I know, I know. I hope everyone has a glass of wine. With them. I haven't had this wine, I think, in about three months when I was last in Argentina. 
Yeah. It's gotten even better. It could it be that that I have some uh, like the coronavirus is is making me uh, like wine more. <laughs> it's making a lot of people like wine more. Yeah, uh, I will say chin chin to you, Laura. <laughs> salud, salud, salud to everyone. Um, so just for order of operations tonight, uh, we're going to talk first just about your project of Luca. Luca is celebrating its twenty year anniversary this year. Um, so we're going to dive into the origin story of that project. We're going to talk about Argentina in general and just how it's evolved as a wine producing country um, and really why so many people are drinking more wine today, but also specifically reaching for Argentina in the US market. Um, and then we're going to talk about La Posta, which is another project you have um, all about the growers of Mendoza. And then we're going to taste. We're going to taste two wines from Luca, one from La Posta. And then at the end, we're going to be taking questions from you all. So for a little bit of housekeeping, um, we, I can't see you because it's a Zoom webinar, but we know you're here and there's a Q&A window where you can submit questions at the end for Laura. And um, I'm excited. So Laura. Somebody Luca. saying don't forget the tango. Oh, the ta oh my gosh. Well, my tango is very bad right now. Uh, I would have to drink a lot more wine to dance tango, but so, I might, La I just might. Lauda is very uh, famous or infamous of hosting her <laughs> tango lessons at her house in San Francisco, <laughs> which is actually, Sally and Robert came to one of that's those, right, right? That's right, that's right, that's right, Robert and Sally were here. I love it, I love it. Um, so Luca is a, is a wine and a brand for me that, having known it in Argentina and worked with it in the U.S., I think it represents three really important stories in Argentina. And one is the old vine story that many people had never known about in Argentina. Two is, you know, exploring new terroirs, especially the higher elevations of the vineyards in the Andes. And then the third is really exploring Argentina outside of just Malbec. Um, so those three storylines, I still feel like are very relevant today in Argentina and are really what is propelling Argentina forward as a, as a wine producing country. Take me back to 20 years ago. How did you see these stories as being so important to Argentina and what gave you kind of that courage to start a wine based around those themes for Luca? Yeah, so may maybe show the next slide with, with Luis because yeah. I, I you know, this is exactly 20 years. Uh, well, not 20 years. I, I guess a little less than 20, but, you know, on the left, uh, you know, and all kinds of people tell me I look the same. I do not look the same. Uh, you never but, age, Lori. I think Luis does look like a teenager uh, <laughs> in that photo. And, and this is Luis, who uh, basically ha has been my partner in this project since the beginning. And then for a couple of years, you know, he was really busy with Catena. We're planting a lot of new vineyards. There was just so much traveling and work to do that we worked with Estela, who was also amazing uh, for a couple of years. And then Estela has gone off to do her own project, uh, which is really exciting and we're really happy for her. And then I, I basically went to Luis and I said, Luis, you know, now that you have all these other people that work with you and that, you know, um, like, don't you want to come back to Luca? And he, he pretty much like almost started crying. Oh, he's the he, best. It was like, he was like, those six years were the worst years of my life. I don't know if Luis is on this call, but I don't know if he is. Um, but, you know, he said, I've missed Luca so much. And it's not like he wasn't involved because he still, uh, you know, manages all viticulture for Catena, which means, you know, that he helps with all the growers that Luca works with. So, you know, he was like always tasting the wines and coming to our tastings. Uh, so he, w he was connected, but uh, you know, this is like his baby. And, uh, and the reason why Luis is so impor important to the Luca story um, is that, you know, Luca, the Luca uh, wines are 100% about the vineyard. Mm -hmm. You know, they're about discovering new places at high altitude, you know, finding old vines in Argentina. When I started 20 years ago, basically, the, you know, the, the word around the block was, uh, you know, no grower is going to make a good wine. All the growers, old vines, new vines, whatever, uh, Uco Valley, the East, Luján de Cujo, they were basically selling the grapes in bulk. They all got the same price. And mm. the only priority was let's produce the most wine we can. And that's why, you know, actually uh, in, in the 70s and, and actually in the 60s, a lot of Malbec was pulled out. There, there was like, there was about... Uh, 80, 
um, thousand or I don't know, 70,000 hectares of Malbec planted, then about more than half was taken out and then it's been replanted. But basically Malbec is not a highly productive variety. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an old vine vineyard uh, was almost like a hassle. Uh, and I had traveled a lot to friends, you know, I, I traveled around California and all uh, the, the quality people were talking about uh, old vines, like for example, Chateau Lafitte, they only allow 40 year old vines to go into their top wines. And we had all these old vines in Argentina. That was the other part of the whole totally. situation. You know, a lot of regions don't have old vines. But mm -hmm. we had old vines in Luján de Cujo, we had old vines in Luca Valley. And so I pretty much, you know, got in a car uh, with Luis and we would just drive around and he'd say, oh yeah, I've tasted those grapes, they're really good. I say, let's go, let's go talk to them. Let's see if we can make a deal to pay more, pay by the hectare and have them let us manage their vineyard. And really, Luca is still the same thing. It's a handshake mm -hmm. deal. Uh, for example, I remember the time with La Borde, uh, the Syrah, where, you know, I, I wanted to know, hey, we're going to put your name on this vineyard. Should we draw up some contract or something? And, you know, I went to him and I said, hey, do you want to write a contract or do you want some kind of assurance? Because I told them, you can use your name anytime you want. And in fact, this is going to give you a little trademark, uh, you know, a stature, the fact that it's already been used. Mm. And he said, and I said, but honestly, you know, you have my word that if you ever want to use your name, you can. And I said, do you want to sign something? And he said, not really. <laughs> he said, your word is good enough. And, and this has been, I've offered the same thing to every single grower. And they've all said the same thing that they just love being acknowledged. They love how we treat them. They love that we care about quality. They all compete with each other. That's the only thing when we all go out to lunch together, it's like competitors because they each want to be the vineyard with the best grapes. And they'll right. literally ask me point blank, you know, you know, Rosas will ask me, well, you know, are my grapes the best or are the Inojosa grapes the best? Or, you know, like Balducci and Pizela. And I mean, you should see me trying to get out of this because, you know, some years actually it might be one of them and another year it might be another one. These are all, uh, Luca are all top vineyards. La Posta are all extraordinary vineyards. Right. So, um, so the story of Luca really is linked to Luis and to the vineyard. And the other thing uh, is that Luis works a lot with the Catera Institute. Daniela is on this call, who is our soil specialist. She's the best. And so all this knowledge that, you know, 20 years of research for Catena that we've done around soils, we can use uh, for vineyards for Luca. So we can uh, find a vineyard that maybe is 50 hectares, but where there's, you know, four hectares that are particularly extraordinary. And we can use those grapes, grapes for Luca. And so, uh, you know, this, this uh, journey that started a long time ago has been a real team effort, although we're a tiny, tiny team. Uh, very few people work on, on this project because my idea is not to make as much wine as possible, but to make, you know, wines that are really artisanally made, that we know the growers, that it's this tight community. And, um, you know, we don't have, like, we have one guy that travels the whole world, poor Mariano, who is, I'm sure is on this call, like, you know, and then Luis will travel sometimes, I travel sometimes, but that's the idea, you know, we are really busy making great wine. And, um, and you know, you, you say, we met, you know, in 2013, I started 20 years ago, but it really seems like a very short time because nothing in viticulture happens quickly. You know, nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, and, oh my gosh. And, but, but it is important that we've had all these 20 years for Argentina. And I think you're going to ask me later about the future of Argentina. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of the future of Argentina has to do with the past of Argentina. We already have, you know, since the 16th century making wine. And then we have, um, you know, for, for, for Luca, for Catena, for, you know, the, the, some of the people that started earlier, though, you know, nobody... My, my father really was the first one who had the guts to say, I am going to make world-class wine in Argentina, mm -hmm. you know, and he basically put everything into that. But there's been a lot of other wineries now making great wines in Argentina. A lot of them, though, with, you know, several generations of winemaking. So it's all this energy, all this collective right. energy uh, that is going to be the future of Argentina. And uh, I will talk more about it in, in the, when we talk about each wine, but uh, I think it's really well, important to, to think of Argentina as, you know, a region that's been making wine for a very long time 
and where you know the the innovation stage is not that young anymore you know right. it's been going on for several decades i think i think the two um points that you've touched upon that many people don't know about argentina one is that yes there are state vineyards where a winery owns vineyards but there's a very important relationship in part of winemaking where the winery buys grapes from these families and that grower winery relationship is really the tie that makes the best wines because the second point is that these families have owned these vineyards for generations um, yeah. which speaks to that element of argentina that this country has been making wine since the 16th century the 1500s yeah. and so yeah. the the term new world region yeah. really doesn't do its justice to the depth of ancestral history and knowledge that these generations have passed on for these vineyards. Um, and especially the Italian influence in yeah. Argentine culture and Argentine wine. Yeah. Um, and tell us more about Luca the name and where that came from. Yeah, well, so uh, Luca the name uh, is my son's name and it's actually his birthday today. Uh, I can't believe today is Luca's birthday. That's yeah, crazy. Here's a, uh, Luca is the one right next to me. Then the most important member of the family currently is Nala, the dog. Oh my he's, gosh. He's the only one that pays attention to me. Uh, <laughs> and, and then my daughter, uh, Nico, and then Dante from the Beso de Dante. But, Amazing. Uh, yeah. So the, the name came from Luca. It basically, I thought, okay, what's a good name? I just, I just had this son. You know, when you have a kid, you're in love with the name of your kid. I, now that I have a dog, I realized I'm also in love with the name of my dog. So I think it's it really easy to name your wine after your dog um, because that is a very strong piece of love. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, it, it, I, could, I was able to trademark it. A lot of times when you're trying to come up with a name, it has to do with the trademark. And so it's kind of an easy question. And then actually I, I talked to somebody who said, you know, my dad told me never to name your your wine after one of your children's or your name because then you you can't sell it and i was like oh that sounds like a fantastic idea i don't ever want <laughs> kids to sell this my vine our you know our family's vineyards or the brands or anything so this is perfect then they oh have my gosh I'm like thank you for telling me this uh because you know who, why would you want to build a winery project to sell it although i mean i know that things change and you know families have circumstances that maybe they have to sell, but I, I find that it's such a beautiful, you know, thing to make wine, to be involved in farming, to, to make something that your ancestors made, that if you mm -hmm. have the luck to be born in, in this world of wine, and you know, I had the luck to be born in wine, but then I had to become a doctor to come back to wine. Right. Uh, but, but that, ha I think there's a lot of people have stories like that with their family, you know, businesses is that you, you want to be independent, you want to, you know, leave your parents, your family, and then you come back, but you come back with so much strength because you've chosen it. Um, yeah. Well, I think another interesting storyline with Luca is that this started when also Vine Connections started, so 20 yeah. years ago. And if anyone can imagine that 20 years ago, people in the United States really didn't A, know what Malbec was, or B, know what premium Argentine wine was, Yeah, you know, bringing in wines that were telling these stories and, and being at price points at, you know, a $20 and above, that was a big step, but it was a determination to show a side of Argentina that was true and real. It just wasn't properly represented in the U S market yet. Yeah. I would agree that Vine Connections played a very important role because, you know, um, I had the idea in mind of, buying grapes from these from these beautiful old vine vineyards from these amazing growers I knew the quality was there but um, you know I was working with my father with Catena which was really selling one bottle at a time I mean I in the right. 90s I was still going on ride-alongs you know I was you know I, I get out of a hospital shift and then the next day you know I remember Nick Rankowski used to always call me like Laura will you go on a ride-along with one of the salespeople and uh you know, I was like, oh, I'm a doctor. I can go on a wine sales call. Like, it is way harder to go on a wine sales call than to be a doctor. It was, it was <laughs> back then. It was back then because, you know, you, people would make you wait. Like, sometimes, yeah. you know, they, they weren't there. And, uh, you know, I remember one time that I finally got somebody really interested. And uh, they said, you know, I think they were me for, with me for about half an hour, which was a very long time for a yeah. buyer to give you half an hour. And then they said something like, oh, 
you know, this wine is so good. I, I love this Malbec, but sorry, I can't buy it because nobody knows what Malbec is, so I can't sell really? it. And literally, my, I, my, that day, I didn't sell a single bottle of wine. And, you know, that is a lot of why I became interested because I realized that if I didn't come and help my father, my country, you know, basically this whole tradition of winemaking, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I had that arrogant sense of a 20-something-year-old that thinks they can change the world. But sometimes you have to think but that we need that. To have the guts. And actually, my yes. parents had the guts because, you know, I ask them a lot of questions like, do you really think you can sell at this price point? Because I knew we had the quality. And my dad taught me a very right. simple thing. You know, he, because at first I started working with him. I knew a lot about science. So that's why I founded the Gatera Institute. So, you know, research trials, like studying the effect of sunlight, you know, the um, effect of pruning, like that, uh, the, doing the, the masal selections. That made sense to me. But this thing called marketing, I didn't even know what it was. I was like, is that doing a shelf talker? Like, is that marketing? <laughs> is yes, and yeah. I, I didn't understand anything. And my dad said, okay, forget about that whole marketing thing. You, you, you'll just learn that. He said, I'm going to teach you one important thing. If you can do double the quality, you know, so basically, you know, you can charge uh, $20 for $40 quality. Mm you're going to win every time. And so we used to wow. actually, and we still do this now, we used to do blind tastings where we put our wine in the middle of a bunch of other wines that were twice the price. And mm -hmm. if the wine was in the same league uh, in terms of concentration, you know, elegance, uh, balance, you know, then it was ready to go. And I, I really don't think there's any other advice to give uh, in, in wine. I, I think that is, should be the tagline of Argentina in general. Yeah. Uh, time and time again, having worked with these wines for many years now, first having Luca be a, and Luposta be a pivotal brand to shift the perspective of Argentina 20 years ago, coming into the market, that really started people's knowledge of Argentina and why we have Malbec on our tables today. And I think it really, what you're speaking to, that quality to price ratio, time and time again, seeing people's kind of aha moments, tasting outstanding Chardonnays, Cabernets, Malbecs from Argentina and hearing the price and then realizing that they would pay at least three times as much somewhere else from another country of origin. Um, which, which brings me to the, the theme and the topic of just wine consumers today. Um, so I think it's been really interesting to see the trends of consumers for beverages, whether it's wine or beer or spirits or other you know, drinks that are coming into the category. But in the past year, and especially right now in this just 2020 year, we've seen a great increase of wine consumption. And not only are people reaching for more wine, but they're specifically reaching for Argentina. Um, and I think that speaks to a lot to, you know, people's, people wanting to drink quality, but knowing that they don't necessarily want to or need to pay a lot of money to get great wine. And that's where Argentina just continues to over deliver. Um, and what's amazing just with data and insights that we've been getting over these past couple of weeks, Argentina has seen a, seen a huge increase for its category growth um, in, in both retail and online sales. Um, and I know we just talked about, especially in the last four weeks, there's been you know, over 25% increase of consumption and purchasing of Argentine wine. Um, and so combining that increase of wine interest, Argentina being a category to reach for, for quality and price, and then that kind of sweet spot price point of around 20 to $22, that's where Argentina really shines. Um, and so me, actually, I have a question. This data, the, the, the price is right for Argentina, the 22 average retail bottle price, uh, is that, um, for Argentina, that's really high. No, that's that's for wine in general, but that's oh, for, okay. that's that's for actually, Argentina. That's for Argentina. We no. have a lot of progress. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's okay. for wine in general, but the wines from Argentina I and see. the price point yeah. really over deliver. Yeah. And that's okay. where you're getting the $40 plus quality and yeah. only paying $20. Yeah. Um, so what has been the experience for you producing these kinds of wines with that mantra for so many years now, and you travel to markets around the world, um, are people really understanding that? And are you seeing similar trends like this 
within yeah. your time in the US. I mean, listen, I can remember the early days with Nick Ramkowski. Like, I mean, I don't know. I love remember the early days because I was actually a lot more scared than he was, you know, because really, like, I had been in all these settings where people would say, oh, Argentina, like I go to the New York Wine Experience and people walk in front of my booth and they like keep on walking, you know. I mean, Argentina did not exist when we started yeah. this. You know, even in the late 90s when we started uh, Luca and La Posta, like, I mean, well, we started Luca first, then came La Posta, but, you know, Luca was a very expensive wine. You know, Catena was a very right. expensive wine, you know, uh, almost 10 years before. And, I mean, Nick Ramkowski from, well, I imagine you all know him from Vine Connection. I mean, he would just get up there and tell some sommelier, like, you don't know what you're talking about, Argentina. <laughs> Argentine wine is as good as the best of France and Italy and all this. And, uh, you know, and he's got his French mother pedigree. So, like, he thinks that because he's got a French mother, he can, you know, say how the wines are. He can do whatever he wants, right? Uh, and, like, but then I would see the magic. People would taste the wine and they would say, wow, you're right. And um, I would always have this moment of fear that while they were tasting, they were going to say no. We, you're not right, uh, but they always would. And, and I still get that response. Um, you know, I think right now, most people have drunk Argentine wine and love it. And, you know, it, like people are very positive, but I still do things like Nantucket Wine Festival, where mm -hmm. you know, it's a very sort of, you know, wine collector, people who drink a lot of French and, um, you know, Italian, very expensive, super Tuscans, a lot of Napa, and they are just blown away. Uh, when yeah. we do a tasting. Um, so I, I think the quality answer is still our strongest suit. Um, mm. And I do agree with you that, you know, Argentina already has this quality image, but we do have a lot of offerings at this price point that now uh, is, is the price point that a lot of people are going to, uh, which is not like in other countries uh, we're seeing, you know, and Cadena sells wine in like 70 countries around the world. Luca in fewer because on purpose, because I don't want to, you know, it's too complicated. I just have a few places where I sell it. A lot in Argentina, Luca is very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in some countries, people are really gravitating to the low end, you mm -hmm. know. In, in, but in the U.S., I think that people are looking for that restaurant experience at home. And yeah. it's easier to open a good bottle of wine than to cook a Michelin star meal. Like, that is not easy. I'm a, <laughs> I am not a good cook. Yes. And, and, and I follow all the instructions and it still comes out bad. So... <laughs> I think it's much cheaper to actually spend a little more on a bottle of wine uh, than to try to become a good cook or actually oh, and, impossible. It might be impossible. Oh, totally. And these are wines that impress. <laughs> I mean, it, it is, it is amazing when you present these wines over and over again, how people you deliver this aha moment, whether they're a wine lover or a master sommelier. Mm -hmm. uh, so it continues to, to have that effect on people. Um, and I think with Luca, I, I love the storyline because obviously so many people know Argentina for Malbec. So we're going to talk a lot about Malbec, but Argentina is also a lot of things outside of Malbec. Yeah. And I love Luca because I get to tell that story. I get to tell both stories. So I'd love to start diving into the wines. And the first wine we're tasting is Luca Chardonnay, the Gilot Chardonnay. Um, and before we do that, I really want to kind of give your, your sort of 101 of how people can start understanding the map of Argentina. Place and regionality is such an important theme for wines from Argentina yeah. and specifically Mendoza. But I think many people need to repeatedly learn what regions mean in Mendoza to start connecting wines to regions. So how do you break down the Argentine map today? Okay, so um, maybe let's go to that next slide with the mountain. This yeah. One. yeah. And then I'll go back to the one we were at before. So, you yeah. know, one thing, it, uh, you know, Lizzie is, is clearly the Chile wine expert much more than I am. But, but, you know, the important thing in this map is, you know, Chile gets a lot of their influence from the ocean, from the Pacific Ocean. And Argentina is really, you know, a continental climate. So Argentina is the one to the right. You know, Mendoza produces about 70% of the wine, uh, but all the, the regions are right by the Andes. They're all on the Western um, border of the Andes. You know, a little lower altitudes, but still cool climate in Patagonia. Uh, even if it's a lot further south, the altitude is a lot lower than in Salta, which is a lot, you know, latitude much further north. You actually get a warmer climate than in Mendoza, but it's much higher altitude because it has to be. So, you know, when you get this mountain climate, you don't have um, the sort of winter rains, you know, you really have a dry winter, and then you have some rains in the summer, which, 
you know, a lot of people come to Argentina and they panic. They're like, oh my God, is your harvest ruined? Um, because it'll, it'll be this huge showers. But we are usually grateful for a little water because it's such a dry climate and yeah. the soils are very rocky. So the water just drains down and it's not, we don't have a big rot problem. We don't have many pests. So Argentina is literally heaven for organic and sustainable farming. And we're gonna, I think we're gonna talk about that a little more busy later. But the reason I wanna show you this map is that if you think of the Andes mountains forming when the two plates in the ocean uh, butted heads uh, 120 years ago, they start going up uh, and they, they formed the Andes uh, mountains about 40 million years ago. But at that point, the Andes mountains are all covered with uh, snow and there's all these uh, fossils in there yes. and different minerals. And then as the, the, the snow starts melting, the glaciers start melting, they start dragging down uh, different materials. And this is what, what an alluvial soil is. You know, it's basically the, the dragging down of materials by rivers and glaciers. But what ends up happening is that in the higher parts, you get some of the heavier rocks. Because imagine you, your course of water, your little river, you know, you're going down at a certain uh, weight and the, the heavier rocks are not going to roll as much. So they stay in the higher parts. Mm -hmm. Then in the middle parts, you get maybe more sands and loam and then further down more clays. Now, it's not mathematical. So you know, let's say you had two little rivers or, or one big river, one little river. Well, the big river is going to have carried out more stones down because it had more force. And then the little, little river will have carried less because it had less force. And then you have these alluvions that form in between the peaks with like these heavy uh, sediments of rock. Uh, and all this diversity of soils from the formation of the Andes and of the soils of Mendoza creates all these different uh, uh, terroirs with different soils. So you might have a vineyard that's only, you know, a few meters away from another one, or even a parcel within a vineyard that has a completely different soil. So you get a lot of aromatic and flavor diversity in the different regions. Now, some regions, you know, so for example, let's go back to the, the previous map. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Uco Valley, which is, um, you know, you've got where it says Uco Valley, it's Tubungato, Tunujan, San Carlos, then you've got Luján de Cuyo, um, you know, further up. Uh, Uco Valley is higher altitude, usually between three and 5,000 feet elevation. So usually you have more stones, but you might have a place where mm -hmm. you get a little clay. Um, you might have more sand in some places, depending on uh, what was happening with the water melting. Um, and, uh, but in general, you know, when you're looking at the Uco Valley, you're looking at very stony soils. We're gonna have some pictures later. And then you've got the, the influence of uh, altitude on temperature, which we'll look at later. Then you've got Luján de Cuyo, which is further down, usually around, you know, around 3,000 feet elevation, plus or minus, um, and further north. So remember, a little north is a little warmer, and you've got a lot of clay in those soils. Uh, although you also have some sand and loam and, and stones, like it, it's still variable, but there's more clay. And clay is, a, is a, a, an alive material, so it, it tends to absorb more nutrients. So Luján de Cuyo is a place where when you have a very rainy year, it tends to not be as good because, you know, you, you can get really soaked up with water. Mm. Like, you know, the, the famous 2001, like we, mm. we didn't, like none of the, the, the wines were Luján de, from Luján de Cuyo were any good, but the Uco Valley was okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but what, what this does is that it really um, changes the flavor of uh, any variety. You know, Malbec is probably what people know best. And the Malbec from Luján de Cuyo is totally different from Luco Valley. And we've actually at the Catena Institute done a lot of research where, you know, through sensory analysis and chemistry, you could actually give a, one of the researchers a bottle of wine, not tell them what it was, and they can analyze it and tell you, okay, this comes from Agrelo. Okay, this comes from San Carlos because of, of the flavor profile. So, and this is something that we have not done a very good job in, in Argentina talking about but it's a lot of what I think you're going to see more of. I mean, with Luca and La Bosa, we have, like with La Bosa, we have different single vineyards and different flavors. But I think that Argentina as a whole has not done a very good job. And in terms of, you know, Argentina 101, I would say Luján de Cuyo, it's a little warmer, clay soils. Uh, it's, it's a lot of old vineyards. Uh, I think it, it's, it's, it's a little bit like the Napa in the sense that where the, a lot of the, the well-known wineries have their, the tourism wineries that people can visit um, and, you know, some really beautiful uh, vineyards there, you know, Paulucci is there. Um, and then the Uca Valley has some old vines, uh, you know, like the Rosas vineyard, many, many vineyards that Luca sources from, 
but it's, you know, most of the vines in Nuco Valley have been planted in the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, my father started planting many vineyards in the 90s, but really more was after 2000. Uh, and it, it's just such a vibrant place uh, to make wine because there's so many vineyards. And remember uh, that 50% of Argentina's vineyards are owned by small growers that own less than four hectares, so less than eight acres. And this is a big part of the diversity of Argentina and why I think the region is so alive because there are already these growers. And, you know, part of what we started with Luca and La Posta so many years ago was, you know, if we can uh, help these growers have better livelihoods, they're not going to sell their land for somebody to build, you know, a refinery or to put housing because they're actually being able to support their family with these vineyards. And, you know, when you talk about sustainability, it's not just about the water, although, you know, water is kind of king right now. Uh, it's about the people and not just the people that you're able to hire. It's also about people staying there. You know, people not wanting to leave, you know, people give energy to a region. And, uh, you know, this, this number, this, this high percentage of small growers, I, I really believe is, is part of the energy of Argentina. And, and it's one of my big goals with Luca and La Posta to keep this alive because, you know, Catena is really all from a state fruit. So, uh, and this, this is literally was one of my motivations to start Luca. It, it was more right. about taking this opportunity for old vines and working with the growers than having my own project. A lot of people think, oh, Laura wanted to have her own thing separate from her father. But honestly, yeah, I love doing things with my father. It's, it's super fun. <laughs> Plus, he, he kind of lets me do my thing because once he figured out that I, I wasn't going to mess things up too much, you know, he's not, he trusted you. You, you know, he, he trusts me. But, and, but what I love about Luca is that I can just go and work with any grower, you know, right. I don't have to follow any rules. And also what's been so exciting about Luis, wait, you guys, I have to see if somebody can open the door. Hey, Dante, can you open the door? I'm not sure. Uh, I love Dante. Okay. Uh, yeah, the dog's out there looking at whoever is uh, coming. Oh yeah, I think somebody, oh yeah, I hear somebody. Okay, good. Somebody <laughs> can open the door. Sorry, guys. Um, so uh, where was I at? It was the uh, working with the growers and working with your growers. dad. Yeah, working with my dad. Oh, and, and going back to Luis. So one of the great things is having, you know, your winemaker be, you know, like he's basically 80% viticulture, 20% winemaker. He wine knows maker. every and, inch of Mendoza. You know, and, and he comes from a winemaking family. His, his family, is, well, mm -hmm. they, they have a, a wine that you guys sell. So he knows a lot about winemaking. Yes. But, you know, if you're going to find the best old vine Syrah vineyard in Mendoza, he knows how to find it. And he's also yes. one of those people that growers say yes to because they trust them. Yes. So that's another thing about him and me is that we are 100% honest people. If we handshake, you know, it, it is like, it's, you know, my mother's grave, like, well, my mom's yeah. alive, but you know how they say, like, do you swear by your, your ancestor's grave? Like they know that our word is our word. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I think so many growers, but you know, just every year, they, a lot of other people try to come buy their grapes, but they work with us uh, because they, they they know that what we promise, we deliver. Mm -hmm. Well, I think all that you're speaking about is it's really the theme of the level of detail, the level of detail that Argentine wine um, really represents and embodies in the level of premium wine that wines like Luca produce in La Posta. It's always so hard for me for someone to look at the map of Argentina or Mendoza and kind of say very general comments of like, oh, wines from Argentina are this, or wines from Mendoza are this. Once you start getting to know Mendoza on a more detailed level and regional level, you realize how different and diverse all of these different micro climates, micro soils, the influence of the Andes Mountains, the Andes Mountains, Everyone in the world should go see yeah, this mountain range. It is one of the most spectacular parts of this earth. It is the longest mountain range in the world. It is the second highest. It is a spectacular just life event seeing the Andes. But everything goes back to the Andes Mountains in Mendoza for both life, culture, history, and especially wine. Yeah, um, a, few, a few bad things. We, we get the hail and the frost. I know. <laughs> and, and it comes, it comes with its... 
I always say it's like the, the Andes personality, like the Zonda wind coming. It's like uh, the yeah, dramatic yeah. side of the Andes. No, we, we don't like the Zonda either. It's like, you know, if you get a Zonda during, um, you know, flowering or raisin, that's it. Like Oof, yeah. 30% down. It's like, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, but you know, it's, um, it's nature, you know, you get a couple of gifts and then it just punishes you. And, you know, I mean, we're seeing that right now and, you know, nature is punishing us a bit, you know, with the, with the COVID-19 and, and, um, yeah. we got to respect nature, you know? Well, for you, I mean, at this point, 20 years ago, you were seeing something as a potential in the Andes. There's something that is so unique to the Andes Mountains in Argentina, not only for irrigation, climate, influence, et cetera, is going up. And so this area of Gualtairi, the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir from an area in the Uco Valley called Gualtairi, which sits at 5,000 feet elevation, no one was planting here yeah. 10 years yeah, ago. Hey, which is realize that it's almost 515. I know, we got to start tasting. Okay, let's okay, taste okay, away. Yeah, yeah, let's. Let's taste the Chardonnay and, and okay, so um, go to the next slide because I want to show the soil. So, so when I started- what, Pine, because this is now a Grand Cru yeah, essentially. Yeah, so, so yeah, so basically there were no vineyards here. My dad planted here because he, um, he wanted to go to the coldest place because he thought I'll get better concentration of minerality. And you know, when people ask me about sustainability, I, I actually wrote an article in this, uh, the Journal of Wine Economics to explain that uh, what we did in Argentina 25 years ago, going to high altitude, looking for cooler climate, is what other regions are having to do now. Mm -hmm. But we had this experience where we put, uh, you know, the the measure, the temperature measuring uh, towers. We studied the soils. We studied the farming. We studied the massage selections. We studied, you know, we're we're still actively studying the soils. You know, Daniela, who's on this call, is studying two identical soils. Um, you know, identical plant populations, mm -hmm. totally different soils in the same vineyard and finding really different um, tastes. And, you know, for all that the wine industry talks about terroir and French people always talking about terroir, actually her study over three years has never been done before of two different parcels, same plant selection, measuring everything from root length to nutrients in the soil to the microbial population that has never been done before. And, um, you know, when I started in wine, and I hope Nick doesn't get offended because I, and there's probably some French person in the crowd, but I had a lot of French people tell me things that I kind of believed because, you know, I had, um, I studied French at a young age because I was obsessed with Sartre and Camus. Uh, and I, I went to France a lot with my father on these trips of, you know, these trips to learn about French wine, not thinking I was going to ever make wine. I was just going as his translator. And a lot of French people would say, oh, you don't have limestone in Argentina. I mean, what is this? This is like all like Straight calcium up carbonate. Yeah. Then they would say like, you don't have deep root systems probably because, you know, they would say you don't have root, deep root systems because um, you irrigate. But the, the way we irrigate is like the, from these canals that the Indians built, we irrigate by eye, which means that you only put water like the rain when you think the, the vineyard needs it and you do water stress. So we have extremely deep root systems. Daniela and her study has found uh, root systems like regularly deeper than two meters. That's, you know, that's what you see in a very balanced entrenched vineyard. So, but all this research that we did, you know, it's still very much in our DNA. So we're still looking for regions like well, there's a water shortage. So in La Rioja, we actually have planted some new vineyards. Great wines can be made there because there's separate water access. And I think that Argentina should be a real inspiration uh, for people looking at climate change of how you can actually find new regions that, that better address climate. And now with, uh, I mean, we've actually had some really cold years, but if we have a really warm year, the cool climate uh, high altitude areas do great. Uh, if we have a rainy year, they do great uh, because of the soils. So actually we have this, we, we've almost like addressed climate change before it started happening yeah. so severely well it's it's ironic your your storytelling about the europeans because when you get to adrian the to Gualtairi, it's so high elevation you have such a cool climate that we've talked a lot about the winkler index before comparatively yeah. climatically with degree days yeah. this compares to cooler areas in france and specifically yeah. an area like burgundy 
which makes in the and best champagne. In the world. Yeah, champagne and, and burgundy. Like what does it has some areas closer to champagne, some areas closer to burgundy. And actually we can write the Malbec there because there's so much sunlight, but you make this Malbec that's so insanely elegant. It's kind of like Northern uh, Rhone Syrah that's so different than Chateau Neuf, you right. know? And, uh, and so, you know, I always, um, when I explain this chart, the Winkler chart, where you go from, you know, up on top are um, the cooler areas to the warmer areas, um, you know, like, uh, like uh, let's see, uh, you know, Jerez or the areas, Greece, right. areas that people know um, as warmer. Um, in France, if you want to go from, uh, you know, Chateau Neuf uh, to all the way to Champagne, it would take six to seven hours. In Argentina, it's a 45 minute drive. Mm. So, you know, that, that allows us to have all these different terroirs, which give all these different expressions of flavor. And you can do single vineyards, single parcel wines, but you can also do blends. And altitude blends can be really interesting because you can take the same variety and you get, you know, some of the texture and the ripeness from some of the lower altitude, some of the black fruits, the chocolate, and then from the cooler climate, you get the florals. And when you blend this together and the minerality and the acidity, you actually can make some pretty amazing wines through these altitude blends uh, that it, it, this is unique to Argentina. You can't do this in other parts of the world. Well, I, I've just loved tasting Luca Chardonnay with people because I think there are different types of, Luke, of Chardonnay drinkers in the world. And because Luca is planted at such high, eleva high elevation, it has such freshness, yeah. um, such ageability to it because yeah. of that. But it also it's has, very mineral. it's very mineral driven, yeah. but it has this depth and, um, and complexity to it that you can get more of a richer style, but it's balanced by that and very high natural acidity. Yeah. So Luca Chardonnay to me plays, you know, appeases both Chardonnay palettes that I usually encounter. Yeah. And it shines with food. Pairing this yeah. wine with food is chefs go crazy for Luca Chardonnay because yeah. it has that duality to it. Um, and the texture of the wine is amazing to pair with the textures of the foods. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I would love to, when people ask me, like, why is the minerality, you know, I'm sure it has something to do with the climate. We know that at cooler climates, you get more of these mineral florals. Um, but honestly, we, we're still researching the answer for. You know, why do you get that combination of minerality florals and creaminess? I mean, I think the sunlight might have an impact, but yeah, we're actually still studying that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I want to shift because we have two different Malbecs to yeah. taste and Malbec, yeah. obviously yeah. we could talk for hours about Malbec in Argentina, yeah. Um, yeah. but let's start with Luca Old Vine. This is for me, you know, the backbone, the pillar of Luca is Luca Old Vine and it has such an important story and expression of the bridal too. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I was obsessed with these old vines because I was, you know, uh, the other good thing I learned in France was that old vines matter. And in Argentina, most people thought yeah. old vines were bad because, yes, and in fact, some of the, the vineyards were not in very good shape. So they did have a point. But, you know, a vineyard that produces half as much as a younger vineyard, why would, you, would a producer love that vineyard uh, if they think the quality is, is the same or less good? But I was convinced that the quality would be better. And when Luisa and I went around, you know, yeah, the quality was better. Uh, and, you know, maybe it was 10% better, but that's what people expect. You know, once they start paying more than $20, you know, people are willing to pay more, not for a 100% increase, but for a 20, 30, 10% increase in quality. And that's what you get from old vines. Mm. Uh, yeah, you can make some great wines with young vines too. But old vines have this kind of balance and texture. Uh, and they're also, you, you know, year in and year, even in a bad year, old vines usually do well uh, mm. because they're just better adapted. They have deeper root systems. And, um, you know, we only recently put the name old vine on the label. And that's just because I'm so bad at labels that, you know, I'm, I'm too lazy to change the labels. But Luca has always, Malbec has always come from old vines because that's what we went looking for in, right. in the vineyards and uh you know it's i don't know what the average age but it's it's probably like in the 50 range uh from all the old vineyards that we use and, and we actually recently did something really uh fun that i that i think is so important for sustainability um is that uh you know argentina has more uh masal selections than probably any other country in the world Mm. Uh, because Malbec is, is planted with pre uh vines nice. and, and the vineyards are all Masal. Like we have some single clone uh, parcels, but most of the vineyards in Argentina are Masal selections. 
and um, they're also 90% of vineyards are own rooted. I mean, that's changing. Some people are now starting to graft more. They're, they're, try, they're starting to plant more single selections of Malbec, but we had to do all that work ourselves because the Cote, the Malbec available from abroad uh, is, is very not diverse. And it, it yields usually, we've done this research, five to 10 times more than Argentine Malbec. So, you know, the, right. this is, you know, in pre phylloxera times, they didn't know how to select for really productive vines. And that's what we got in Argentina, fortunately. And fortunately, we did have all those horrible years of Argentina being a closed country, you know, right. fortunately and unfortunately, because a lot of bit, bad thing happens, you know, military governments and stuff. But for viticulture, mm -hmm. it was great that not a lot of, um, of vine material came in. And so all this diversity of Malbec was preserved. And the, the gentleman in this picture, Mr. Rosas, he's the larger one, you know, a dear friend of mine, he had this old vineyard that it really at one point, you know, he had to, he had to replant it. And we actually pulled that whole selection and we replanted it in, mm, in a right. really fine spot uh, in, in Guadalajara. Right. And so, you know, that's true sustainability is, is not letting this, this gorgeous uh, Masal selection be lost. Uh, right. and, and, you know, and someday that, that's going to be an old vine vineyard. Uh, but, but just as important as old vine is not losing uh, vine selections. And that's something that the world has not woken up to. You know, when Burgundy, you know, started trying to preserve their old selections, they'd lost, you know, 80% of their, of their Massa selections because they'd replanted, you know, much more limited selections and they're not trying to increase that diversity. A lot of countries are trying to do that, but in Argentina, we never lost it. And that's another thing that, that I think very few people know about Argentina, that we have you know, these ungrafted vines and such a huge selection of pre phylloxeric vineyards. I, I, I feel like I want to make billboards of it and make t-shirts, yeah. you know, <laughs> just saying like the oldest vine viticultural DNA and, yeah. and material is preserved in South America. Like yeah. everyone yeah. in the wine industry well, needs to know this. I, I even, I have even told uh, some French people that I think that uh, Argentina is the old world for Malbec and they'll kind of squint. I agree. Bit, like, I mean, as long as I stay away from Cabernet and Merlot <laughs> and, and uh, you know, Semillon, like, I, th I think that they're, they're, and Pinot Noir, I think they're okay with it. I, I agree. I believe me, the terms old and new world, I think, become defunct after that because the older world is preserved in South America and Argentina. Um, yeah. I think we could do a whole nother webinar just about Malbec, its history, its, its story in Argentina and its future. Um, but I would say overall that that combination of both old vine and Malbec coming together with Luca, this wine I think has set the bar for what premium Malbec can be for a lot of Malbec lovers in the US. Um, it's made the top 100 wine spectator list multiple times. Um, it is just time and time again, the wine that people see as what Malbec can do on, on the higher premium stage and quality stage. It's just a beautiful wine. And I always encourage people to hold a few bottles because an aged vintage of Luca Oldine is beautiful. Um, yeah, no, it does, it does age really well. It does. Yeah. So uh, similar story with Malbec, we have a whole other project that you started just on the grower story with La Posta. Yeah. Um, so tell us how this came about. And yeah. honestly, La Posta for me still to this day completely drives that message to people of not all Malbec tastes the same. Yeah. Um, so yes, tell me more so, about the Well, I mean, basically we were finding all these beautiful old vine vineyards, but you know, not all of them had the quality for, you know, the Luca price point. Uh, and um, so, I mean, uh, this really had a lot to do with Ed and Nick from Vine Connections is they thought there was a space for single uh, vineyard uh, wines at this price, you know, around the $20 mark or a little below uh, from Argentina. And literally when we started with La Posta, there were no other single vineyard wines at this price point. Wild. Uh, and, Wild. Uh, and we really wanted to honor these growers because, you know, for many reasons. First of all, because they should be honored because they were the ones who, who made the decision to plant that vineyard, to preserve that vineyard. Uh, you know, it's, it's their heart and soul in that place. Um, and then I don't know, I was kind of surprised that they all were all so happy that we put their name on the label. And like Fazio is one of our main customers in the world. Like he buys a ton of wine because he, yeah. he, he has a, a lot of parties. He's kind of a party guy. And like he gives a bottle of this wine to all his friends, to all his families, for every baptism. Like, 
you know, this wine is poured a lot around Mendoza and we give them a really good price. It's practically cost, you know, it yeah. is cost. I, it might even be below cost. Because yeah. We want them to be really excited about the wine. Um, and so, uh, and then if you want to go in the next slide with uh, Paolucci. Yeah. I mean, he's another just dear friend. Um, you know, he, now his vineyard is being managed by his daughter and his, uh, his son. And it's really great because she's the, the engineer of the vineyard. And, you know, that's another family that, you know, transitioning from all men to, you know, women in power positions. And, you know, you're seeing it all over Mendoza. You know, this is what I say about uh, wineries and, and wine business is, you know, people ask me, well, Laura, you know, was it hard? And I'm like, listen, I mean, there's women in wineries all over the world right now because they're stuck with us. You know, most wineries are family businesses. And, you know, you're yeah. stuck with your daughters. They're there. They ask for a job, you know, and <laughs> they're smart and they're hardworking. So, you know, I think that, you know, the wine industry it has changed so quickly because of the family uh, aspect. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. each, so the, the, in the La Posta lineup, there are three different Malbecs, uh, three different family growers and three different regions within Mendoza. Yeah. So there's so much of the history part of the, the wine store in La Posta, but it's such a great educational exercise to taste each single vineyard side by side. They all have completely different personalities. Um, and it has to do with the soil, the climate, the age of the vines. Um, and it instantly answers that question for people or, or you know, gives them a new perspective of that that feeling of, oh, all Malbec tastes the same, or what does regionality have to do with anything in Argentina? You'll see it in the glass with wines made like this. Um, and I think just, again, we could talk about Malbec a lot, but it's been amazing to me to see Malbec see such, you know, a growth in the U.S. and, you know, people wanting to equate known varietals with countries to having this kind of arc and, and dip. But Malbec to me is still so sought after by wine lovers. Everyone, Malbec is this amazing um, wine to drink that has such depth and complexity, but has such an emblematic softer tannin, amazing aromatics, especially when you get to higher, higher elevation Malbecs. Um, I think there's only, it's, we're only at step one of discovering what this varietal can really do. Uh, and I'm, I'm yeah. sure you Yeah, Lizzie, this is what I always say to people when, if they ask me, which they have asked me, what comes next to Argentina after Malbec? Right. I say, listen, first of all, this variety has been ra around since Roman times, 2,000 years ago. Nothing lasts for 2,000 years unless it's good. And that's the bottom line. You know, Malbec has, you know, complexity, has beautiful aromatics. It has these incredibly smooth tannins. At least Argentine Malbec does. There's something about mm -hmm. the soil climate, maybe the plant selections. And it's, it's kind of like heaven because, you know, who doesn't want a really rich wine that's smooth, you know? Right. And it ages well, it pairs well with food. I, I think it actually goes really well with spicy food because of the, the sweetness in the tannins. That's not from sugar, but it's, it's native to the variety. And, um, and it has like, you know, diverse character for each region. So, you know, to me, like Malbec is here to stay. Like I, I, I wouldn't ask an Argentine what comes after Malbec. Like I wouldn't ask a Burgundian what comes after Pinot Noir. Why would you? Exactly. They're so beautiful. Exactly you know? what I say. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Well, uh, we had a lot of people uh, put questions in before okay. the um, uh, webinar today, and I want to get to a few of them at least before okay. we, we part ways. Um, I think just in general overall, what do you think, Laura, is for you the most exciting part of Argentine wine today, and how do you see that playing into the future of Argentina um, for its wine? What, what makes you the yeah. most excited yeah. about Argentina today? Well, you know, first of all, I do think that we provide this, this incredible value, you know, and, and it's, it's value at the high end, you know, we can make such beautiful, expressive wines and regionally diverse, you know, we have different flavors from different places. We also have this variety called Malbec that is unique to the world with this incredible heritage. We have all this genetic diversity. We've done all this research to preserve something that the world the rest of the world doesn't have other varieties don't have this genetic diversity so you know it's a really unique position to be in especially for climate change because we might need some of these old selections you know for the future and that's one of the things that we're studying a lot at the Catena Institute we've also you know started this journey to cooler to, to figure out how to address climate change 
not yeah. just with you know, going question. to the altitude. Mm -hmm. We are experts in water management because we've had to deal with water shortage for hundreds of years. You know, the, our region, if we didn't have the canals built by the American Indians, we couldn't make wine here. And I also think we have this really strong native culture of wine drinking that, you know, became a lot stronger when all these Italians and Spaniards and immigrants came, you know, six million of them came to Argentina. But that means, you know, uh, um, wine is Argentina's national beverage. People drink wine in Argentina. In, in other countries, you know, um, let's say Chile, which, you know, I think Chile makes incredible wines and they, have, they also have incredible diversity and such a great story to tell. But people don't, don't grow up drinking wine in Chile. So right. there's a much less, you know, wine drinking culture. So we have much more of like a French style or Italian, Spanish style. And that it has the energy. And also these growers, these families that grow. And, and the reason why people go and start a family business growing vineyards or why they preserve a family uh, vineyard, you know, for four or five generations is because it's part of your culture. And, um, you know, we have, like, somebody was telling me that in Australia, there's no Australians harvesting because, you know, Australians don't want to harvest. I think California has a similar situation. There's not that many Californians harvesting, you know. Uh, and, you know, now a lot of the Mexican-Americans, they don't want to do it either. You know, it's, it's, it's becoming, you know, difficult to find people to work. You're having a lot to, to use machines. In Argentina, mm -hmm. it's really part of the culture. You know, people, they're still... You know, we're actually working on that because a lot of people in Argentina also want to move to the cities and we're working really hard to make it more interesting to them having better housing and schools. And this is a big part of our, uh, the, we have a foundation for this because that is a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. But, the, you know, this strong, important uh, culture that we have for winemaking is a big part of the future. So, I mean, I, I only see good things for Argentina. I am worried about climate change, though. That, that is my big worry for the whole world. And that's why, you know, at the Catena Institute, we, collab we collaborate with, uh, you know, groups in the U.S., UC Davis, University of Bordeaux, University of Burgundy, Australia. Like, we are always collaborating because that is a big problem. And uh, no one country is going to solve it. Right. Well, I think all of the work that you've, you and the team have done with soil studies, climactic studies, and really, like you were mentioning, all of this unknowingly but preparation work for these times into the future will pay off and and will be an example for a lot of other wine countries too um i i'm so i've seen argentina evolve just within the last decade or so and i think it's never made it's it's made the best wines it's ever made right now and and i think that is the same statement every single harvest um well, no, we so, did have we have we did have a few hard years <laughs> But with, I with think like that half, of, half as much the production, like I tell you, man, those are some, we had three years. Small oh, years. Not, it's not to say you haven't had hard, like hard great, harvest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hard, but let, the, last two, sure. the last three years have been pretty easy and good and, and nice production. I, I think El Nino year. was a tough, a tough time. Yeah, um, yeah. But this generation of winemakers, I think is so talented and uh, just so forward thinking and learning from all the world of wine and, and making wines then true to Argentina when they come back. Um, so uh, I think we could talk forever. Uh, a lot of other questions, Laura, were kind of personal questions about you. So I thought we'd play a little game uh, called Why Not? And just so people can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, you might want to drink some wine for it if you want. <laughs> I already did. It's a, it's a very simple game. I'm going to say two words and you're going to tell me without thinking, just what you'd rather of the two words. So okay. your favorite pick of the two words. So would you rather Malbec or Chardonnay? You're killing me. I'm drinking Chardonnay right now. It's perfect. <laughs> right now, Chardonnay, but- Chardonnay, okay. More, right now, Chardonnay, yes. San Francisco or Mendoza? Mendoza. Mendoza. Mountains or ocean? Mountains. Empanadas or choripan? Pan. Oof. Italy or France? Italy. Mendoza sunrise or Mendoza sunset? Sunrise. Ooh, so good. And are you a morning person or are you an evening person? Morning. Love it. Okay, so now, now it's just tell me one word, the first word that comes to you when I say this. Um, Luca. Mi amor. La posta. Los productores. 
Mm. Los Andes. Nieve. Snow. 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 I say snow. it in English. Oh, I love it. Um, Argentina. Corazón. Heart. Ooh, heart. I love it. Um, and Harvest 2020. Miedo. Fear. Fear. And you can say a little bit more about that because someone did ask about harvest. Yeah, so we, we basically we had a harvest that was three to four weeks earlier than usual. Thank mm -hmm. God. I mean, at first we were a little upset because the harvest is about 30% down in uh, production volume mm -hmm. because we had uh, quite a bit of frost, but the quality is really good. But it came three to four weeks early. We thought when quarantine went in that they were going to close us down and we still had, had to harvest about 20%. Normally we would have still only have done half of the harvest by this right. time, by, right. by mid-March. Uh, so we were able to finish, but with a lot of precautions. Uh, I am basically talking to my quality control person and the winemakers and viticulturists every day because, you know, my essential workers are the people who work in the winery. You know, the people mm -hmm. in the bottling line, the, the people in the winery. Uh, so we've sent everybody home that can work from home. And then in the winery, you know, we have these horrible plastic things. Um, you know, it's like a yeah. little cubicle for people to have lunch. And um, when it first started, we had people like sit at a different tree to eat lunch because it was, right. it was sunny. Like now it's really cold, but you know, like everybody would take a tree and sit under there to eat. And you know, they'd shout to the other person like a few meters away. Right. Um, but the priority was keeping people safe. Um, you know, we have all kinds of protocols where nobody crosses you know, sees somebody else so that if, you know, if one person turns sick, then another team that's never seen that team can come into work because, you know, we live from wine and our team, a lot of wineries in Argentina, they had uh, people not show up. Every single one of our employees showed up wow. to work because mm -hmm. they, um, they get it that if we don't sell wine, you know, what are we going to do? you know, and we've also like distributed a lot of food to the, the lowest paid people because a lot of them have now become the sole uh, earners for their families. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like there might've been two or three people in their family that work that are not working and that right. are not getting any assistance. So, you know, some of our employees have become the single earners. So we're giving them help uh, so that they can help their families. But um, yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad nature, it, ironically, is a very fast and furious, hot harvest. And ironically, that came into, yeah. to, to be a positive thing to get yeah. people safe and get harvest yeah. um, complete in a safe way. Yeah, um, I, I would say it was drier than, than hot, you know. Dry. Mm -hmm. it, it did cool off towards the end. So, but, but the dryness is what, what and the, the, the combination of that with some frost, it was the, you know, the lower yields. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Laura. I want to thank the Luca team for all of your hard work getting these great wines to us. Uh, big shout out to Luis. Obviously, his ears are burning. We've talked about him a lot tonight. Um, I want to thank the Vine Connections team. They're a huge support um, for our webinars. Yeah, thanks uh, to everybody in Argentina and the Vine Connections team. Thanks to you guys because yes. you're working so hard. I know you are. I, I find that everybody that is working, you know, that, you know, it's we're fortunate to have a job is actually working harder than they worked before. Yes. And uh, it's, it's amazing to still connect. I know we have a lot of our trade partners around the US um, on the webinar tonight. And these are a few retailers around the country where you can find Luca and La Posta. Um, we thank you for your partnership. Again, all of this can't work with all of us without all of us being part of the chain of connecting good wine to good people. Um, you can, uh, this whole webinar was recorded, and so you can go to vineconnections.com forward slash webinars to re-listen, um, forward it on to anyone else who missed it tonight. Um, and we just thank you all for your time. Such, such a pleasure, Laura, as always, to sit across from you. Um, so I raise my, my, my glass of old vine Malbec. I raise it to you. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Lizzie, and, and a big hello to everybody that was listening. I'm very sad not to be able to see all your faces, but I, I know, I know. We'll have to go through all the chats and say yeah. hello to everyone, yeah. but uh, yeah. we love you guys. Cheers. Okay. Thank you so much. Salud. Salud. Salud.